Welcome to the Lee Fennell Museum and Garden this morning. My name is Roger. I'm a volunteer here at the uh, museum. I serve as a docent and work as a gardener. I also am uh, very interested in the Civil War. So we want to give a brief presentation this morning on the soldiers of Alexandria. Very brief. And their importance to the town. So Alexandria was occupied by the Union Army from May 1861 to 1865 and it became a major supply base, staging area, and hospital center for the federal armies that were operating in Virginia. Now most of the wartime activity occurred to the west of Alexandria. There were temporary structures over there, like a commissary mill, army stables, a cattle yard, a bakeries, military hospitals, and contraband barracks, and so forth. Now thousands of Union soldiers passed through or were stationed in Alexandria during the war. Now the Lee Fendel House behind us here was actually converted to a hospital called the Grossvenner Branch Hospital in 1863. Uh, so the common soldier, like I'm dressed like a private today, the common soldier became a fixture in the house until 1865 when the war ended. So the purpose of this brief talk is to shed a little light on these soldiers, how they dressed, where and how they camped around Alexandria, and how they departed Alexandria to wage war. So I'll be focusing on private, privates, as I mentioned, as exemplified by Private Wilbur Fisk of the 1st Vermont Brigade. So today I am dressed like Wilbur Fisk. There is a picture taken of Wilbur Fisk at that time. Do I look like him? <laughs> kind of, right? Okay, so Wilbur Fisk was a private in the 2nd Vermont Regiment underneath the 1st Vermont Brigade. He also at the same time served as a war correspondent of the Green Mountain Freeman, an influential newspaper published up at Montpelier, Vermont. So he wrote a lot of articles back to the newspaper through the entire war. Whenever he wrote an article, he signed his name as the Anti-Rebel. <laughs> so he wrote about slavery, he wrote about the Confederate States, he wrote about battlefields, the wounded, the slain, and so on quite prolific. In fact, in his first letter to the newspaper, Fisk wrote, by the way of preface, I ought to say that my rank here is that of a private, and privates are expected to know just enough to obey orders. Many of, many of us have yet to learn even that. <laughs> so that was Wilbur Fisk. So now I want to just briefly de uh, describe the uniform that Wilbur Fisk would have worn in those days. Again, I'll show you his picture. If you notice, the hat he's got on, it's called a kepi, K-E-P-I, and it's got a white cross. That's called the Greek cross, and that was the insignia for the 6th Corps in the Union Army. There was another cap that was worn also by the troops back then. This is called a forage cap. Set this down for a second. So this is a forage cap right here, as compared to a kepi. Okay, take these hats off now and put on my belt. Okay, this round thing on the belt here is called a, bra a brass eagle breastplate. It's a beautiful eagle with arrows in its talons. This is the cartridge box. This is where the cartridges were held. Um, a cartridge consisted of paper that enclosed and sealed a bullet, a mini ball. And right here, this is a mini ball. You see it there. So that was within the cartridge. These were very accurate. They were ammunition for the Springfield rifle, and they could fire up to 203, two to 300 yards, even up to 500 with a marksman. Now this is the cap pouch right here. This held the percussion caps, which ignited the gunpowder by striking the nipple at the end of the barrel. This is an oval U.S. belt plate down here, beautiful U.S. This is a mucket over here. Okay, this was a mucket used for boiling and drinking. It's got a bale, this is a handle, 
the bale, and it's got a lid that can open up. Like, <laughs> yeah, we'll try that later. <laughs> okay, we also have a canteen here. It's covered with a wool little jacket, and you wet you wet in the wool, and it keeps the water cool. It's got a cork stopper. We also have a haversack. This was either tarred or not tarred. The tarring would keep it keep the moisture out. It was used for uh, food, like uh, salt pork, hard tack. They may have put extra cartridges in here and any personal items as well. The shoes that I'm wearing, you can see them a little bit there. They're called Brogans and they were, they didn't have a left or right shoe. They were both made the same and they were very uncomfortable and caused a lot of blisters. Now the 6th Army Corps is famous for its epic march to the Battle of Gettysburg which was about 63 miles in three days. So uh, imagine the sore feet uh, during that time, okay? Okay, let's talk about Camp Griffin now. So this was a Union Army camp near Alexandria. Uh, it was occupied by the 1st Vermont Brigade from October 1861 to March 1862. It's located in present day McLean, Virginia. Um, it consisted, the brigade consisted of the 2nd through 6th Vermont Infantry Regiments and the 26th New Jersey Regiment. And the brigade became a famous unit in the Civil War, had more men killed in action during that war than any war in U.S. Army history. The reason why they were involved in very serious fighting on General Grant's overland campaign to Richmond in 1864. Okay, now. The headquarters up there was in a building called Salona. There's a picture of it. Okay. So Salona was built in 1810 to 1812. It was occupied by General Baldy Smith during the Camp Griffin era, and he helped organize the 1st Vermont Brigade. Of note, Salona was acquired by Light Horse Harry Lee when he married Matilda Ludwill Lee in 1782. And we are standing on land that was purchased by Light Horse Harry Lee in 1783. So there's a connection there. Now, Salona was also significant during the War of 1812 when James Madison and his wife Dolly had to flee Washington when the British burned the city. And they eventually reunited at Salona. So Camp Griffin consisted of thousands of tents clustered around a hill west of the Chain Bridge, which is on the Potomac River. The 1st Vermont Brigade settled in for a season of training and preparatory work. Now, fortunately for us, there was a photographer named George Houghton. He took many remarkable photos of the, of the Vermont camps and soldiers during the period. And some of these are published in the book, A Very Fine Appearance. Now, we have a picture of one of these camps just to give you an idea on what soldiers were staying in in their camps around Alexandria. I think this picture was utilized by Ken Burns in his Civil War uh, production. Turn the page here. So Wilbur Fisk was a soldier at Camp Griffin. He wrote about the activities of the 2nd Vermont Regiment. Now, many of these soldiers were very young, um, as witnessed by the pictures that George Houghton took. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, Tom Cochran, a young Irish immigrant, was also a private in the 2nd Vermont Regiment, so he probably knew Wilbur Fisk. Um, anyhow, he eventually was shot and wounded at the Battle of Wilderness and then was mustered out in 1864. But I had another great-great-grandfather named Joseph Rand who served in the 3rd Vermont Regiment. He was wounded at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse and ended up at a hospital here in Alexandria out at the Episcopal Seminary. So, unfortunately for a lot of these young soldiers, disease was rampant in the camps. A sergeant or Surgeon General of the Army of the Potomac, a man named Charles Tripler, 
referred to the brigade as the disease-ridden Vermont Brigade. Two kinds of diseases affected these troops, childhood diseases, including measles and mumps, chicken pox, and camp diseases like diarrhea, dysentery, malaria, and typhoid fever. In fact, on December 12, 1861, about 25% of the almost about 4,900 Vermont Brigade troops were excused from duty because of sickness. So following this experience through March of 1862, uh, the, the Vermont Brigade left Camp Griffin and they marched down to Alexandria. On their way to Alexandria, they spent their first night at Flint Hill, which is out by Highway 66, west of town. And then they went by the Fairfax County Courthouse and eventually made it to Alexandria. So while waiting at the wharf late that day to, to be transported down to Yorktown as part of General McClellan's Peninsular Campaign, Wilbur Fisk penned these beautiful patriotic words down at the wharf. And I'm going to read those to you. Before I proceed further, I would like to remind the reader that if he has never stood on the wharf at Alexandria and had a view of Washington and its public buildings from that standpoint, just as the, just as the sun was shedding its last rays, he has failed to witness one of the most prominent beauties of art which our country can boast. The noble old capital, towering far above all the rest, the white marble reflecting the lingering rays of the sun and its lofty dome pointing heavenward, as if proudly conscious of being the seat of power for a great, and yes, and I will say it, a free nation, loses none of its beauty, though seen at a distance of eight miles. A view of these enkindled my patriotism more than the best inspirational speech on the Union could have done, though delivered with the most impassioned eloquence. Who would not fight, desperately if need be, rather than have this monument of our national greatness fall into the hands of an insurgent power? And who would not almost blush to acknowledge himself an American citizen should such a catastrophe occur? Well, thank you for your interest in the Lee Fendel House Museum and Garden. We will be offering a Civil War walking tour in the near future, so keep checking our website on that. I just wanted to show you the two main sources for information for today's talk. This is a fantastic book called Hard Marching Every Day by Wilbur Fisk. It's his letters that he wrote up to Montpelier, Vermont during the war. And lastly, this is a very fine photographic book called A Very Fine Appearance. And it's got some wonderful pictures of the Camp Griffin area during that period there when they were up there. So thank you very much and have a great day. Well, welcome back to the Lee Fendel Museum. I'm gonna continue the presentation on Private Wilbur Fisk of the 2nd Vermont Regiment. So in January 1863, Wilbur Fisk returned to this area following the Peninsular Campaign. Fisk wrote at that time, declining health, a misfortune which but few soldiers can prevent rendered me physically incapable of enduring another march and obliged me with a number of my comrades to sink a temporary asylum in one of the army hospitals. Now this hospital was called the Mount, Hez Mount Pleasant Hospital. It was situated about one mile north of the heart of Washington, D.C. So he wrote about his perceptions of the hospital. I want to read briefly about this. Remember, Lee Fendel was a hospital as well from 1863 to 1865. So uh, Fisk wrote, I am aware that there has been complaint made by many of their treatment in these hospitals, but I am unable to see how so many sick men could be cared for better than we are at this place. Other hospitals may be differently managed. I do not presume to judge. Here, everything we desired and needed was unhesitatingly granted. There was a very efficient corps of nurses, male and female, and they spared no pains to render their patients as comfortable as lay in their power. I think they entertained heartfelt sympathy for the sufferings of those under their care and did the best they could to alleviate them. Especially is this true of the women nurses. If any who see this have friends in this hospital, they may take my word for it. They are well treated and have excellent care. And the prospect of their being restored to health 
is scarcely less than it would be if they were at their own homes in Vermont. I also visited the Harwood Hospital, which is situated about one mile east of the Mount Pleasant Hospital, and I regret that I cannot give so good an account of that place as of the hospital where we stayed. But it had then just received a large influx of patients, larger than there were accommodations to receive, and they were without efficient organization. Consequently, there was much complaint and considerable suffering. The tents were without floors, and many of them had no beds. The very sick were suffering greatly from want of care. <coughs> so, you can see the variability in the hospitals back then. So, he finally left the hospital at, at uh, Pleasant, at, uh, excuse me, Mount Pleasant Hospital. Um, but, he was still not totally well, he was still convalescent. So, he was sent to a convalescent camp located just outside of Alexandria here. He described it as just on the brow of a hill, just back of the city from the river, and right on the road leading from Alexandria to Fairfax. Now here, <clears throat> Fisk described contemptible conditions. Contemptible. In his words, the name of the camp explains its use. It is impossible, I suppose, for the government to furnish hospitals enough to contain all the sick and wounded men and keep them there till they are well. As soon as they are considered in a fair way for recovery, they must leave the hospital to make room for more needy sufferers. Often when all the hospitals have their full complement of patients and all seem to be getting along finally, an order comes to make room for a large number more and these must be attended to at all hazards. The only way to arrange this business was to establish a camp where those the nearest well and best able to take care of themselves could be sent and thus make more room for others to whom neglect would be certain death. Hence, the origin of this, of this camp of convalescence. I shall live to be an aged man indeed, if I live to forget the day that introduced me to this camp, which honest critics have considered of all places the one most miserable. He continues, we were divided up according to the states to which we belonged. New York troops were sent to one part of the camp, Pennsylvanians to another, and the Vermont boys to their particular limits. The prospect before us seemed more dismally discouraging than ever. The rain had converted the clay soil into mud or mortar to the depth of several inches. Inside of the tents as well as outside, it was nothing but mud. I never saw a more cheerless place in my life or even a well man's habitation. And I have seen those that were gloomy enough in all reason. But this was for convalescent men, men in just the condition to need good keeping, as farmers say, and to need the best care. Weak and crippled men were consigned to quarters more contemptible than any that a conscientious farmer ever thought fit to offer his swine. <laughs> so those are pretty strong words. So the point in reading them is that there was a lot of variability in these hospitals apparently, and he had a bad time at the convalescent camp. Uh, just one more reading that's kind of fun, is that eventually Fisk left that convalescent camp, went back to the war, and he described a happier time when he returned to Alexandria on a train with his unit on August 20th, 1863. And uh, Fisk wrote, about 10 o'clock, we got aboard a rickety train and came to Alexandria. We camped near the railroad till Wednesday morning when we became aboard this boat, the steamship Erickson. During the interval of our stay at Alexandria, the paymaster made us another visit and paid off part of the brigade. His visit was quite in time as there was a glorious chance there to spend money, which many could not have improved had it not been for the opportune arrival of a supply of the welcome visitor. Peddlers of every description swarmed through our camps and all were more or less patronized. Having been long in the field away from trade of all sorts, we had many wants to supply. Doubtless of the money paid us, Alexandria retains the largest share of it. <laughs> so that's kind of a nice ending to uh, some of the stress that our soldiers had in our hospitals
perhaps in our hospital here at Lee Fendel, which was called the Gross Fenner um, um, Annex. So, in conclusion, um, we plan to offer some walk-in Civil War tours uh, in upcoming months, and days even, and uh, so keep checking our website for registration. And thank you for your interest in Lee Fendel and the Civil War.